Good morning, everybody, and um, welcome to this session. It's a huge honour for me to be here um, today. As uh, echoing very much what uh, Michelle said, I think the ethos of this summit is absolutely brilliant. It's really long overdue, and it's incredibly pertinent. We all have causes that feel incredibly important right now, particularly where we are this morning after the events of last night. And um, charity, social causes, and entertainment have an incredibly important uh, place and they have an important point of collaboration and that's what we're going to be discussing today in this panel. We're going to be talking about the culture of collaboration and what is the content that really makes a difference and I'd like you to give a warm welcome to my brilliant panel who are going to come up on stage now, Simon Gunning. Welcome on up, Simon. Uh, Simon Gunning, who is the CEO of CALM. Uh, Miles Jacobson, who is um, uh, the head of studio, um, a football manager and a studio director. Big round of applause for Miles. <laughs> Samir Patel, CEO of Comic Relief, something that brilliantly brings together good causes and entertainment. And please welcome to the stage Sophie Neary, who is director at Meta. So what we're going to try and do in this panel is really sort of dig down a bit into um, collaboration. And as we've sort of been hearing, um, the way content can tell stories is incredibly powerful. And of course, we've just heard, oh, Gorinda's leaving. Say so goodbye sorry, to Gorinda. Bye, Gorinda. <laughs> Bye. Contact me on social media if anyone needs <laughs> I love it. That was the most subtle, like, like you know when people creep down. It's like when I'm doing a, a stand-up gig and someone leaves, they sort of think if they go like that, they become invisible. Bye! It's all right. Bye, 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 bye. And um, we want to talk about collaboration in a way which is more than just about, you know, CSR, as important as that is, and more than just fundraising, again, as important as that is. We really want to talk about how this particular point of collaboration between charity, social cause and entertainment can change views, it can change attitudes, it can remove stigma, it can change the narrative in, in really, really powerful ways. So we've got a brilliant, brilliant panel to take us through this. Um, Miles, I'm going to come to you first. And, you know, you have been doing incredible work with Sports Interactive for the last 20 years. Um, your amazing game, Football Manager. Um, I'd like to have one called, can you design one called Cabinet Manager, where we can all pretend to like run the cabinet and see if we can do a slightly the, better? Bizarrely, there is one called Democracy, <gasps> which is exactly that. It's a very good game. All right, okay, I should be downloading not, that. Not made by us. Okay, but. well, that's something too. So you have... You've been a real early adopter of this collaboration. You've been doing it for about 20 years. Tell us, you know, why you, why did you start doing this all those years ago? And what was it like at the start when you were quite an early pioneer? So before I was working in games and also during the time that I was working in games, I also worked in the music industry. And since Band-Aid, it's just been a natural thing that's happened in the music industry. So I worked on the first Help album with War Child. Um, we did a, a single for Shelter called Putting a House in Order that involved Hawkwind doing a cover version of a Rolling Stones song with Sam Fox on vocals, which is quite an interesting mix. <laughs> um, and I think it's just the way that I've been brought up. Um, I'm first generation British. My parents were both from South Africa. My mum was an anti-apartheid protester. My great grandparents had been chased out of Eastern Europe by the Nazis. Um, when you're kind of brought up in that environment, you're looking around for things to, to support. And um, when we used to make a game called Championship Manager before we moved to Football Manager. And when, when we made that move, um, there were a bunch of different publishers who wanted to sign us. Um, and we couldn't decide between them. So I sent a fax to five different publishers saying, we'd like to donate 10p to a charity of our choice from every game that we sell. And the first one that replied was Sega. And that's why we signed with them. So we then went round to meet a bunch of charities. And what we found is that the, the larger charities just wanted us to write out a cheque 
didn't want us to be involved at all. Right. We weren't that so interested. So it was quite transactional. Yeah, and some of them didn't believe that we were going to give them money for nothing. We didn't want anything back at all. And because I'd worked with War Child on the Help album, when we went to see them, we could see the amount of difference that it was going to make to people. Um, they were an obvious charity to work with. And I think we've raised one and a half million for them from game sales so far. But this shirt that I'm wearing today, we have um, our CRM system. Uh, we've invented a football club called FMFC and we've got a lovely shirt from Hummel. It's really nice, War Child logo on it. Um, we did an away shirt, which is what this one is, and said to War Child, if you can find a sponsor for the sleeve, you can sell the shirt, all the money will go to you and you get the sponsorship. I mean, I'm not sure which sleeve it's on, but there's a TikTok logo on there and they paid a six figure sum to be the sleeve partner on a shirt for a fictional football club that was only being sold for War Child. So, so that, that's on the monetary side, and obviously we promote them in game as well, but we also promote other um, charities in game. We've worked with Kick It Out for many years because racism shouldn't be in society, shouldn't be in football. But we've also been able to do um, other things at the start of the pandemic. Um, we knew that our, our playtimes were going to go up when the pandemic happened because it's a pretty good way to escape. Um, but we also knew that people were really going to struggle with their mental health and blokes don't talk about it as much, you know, until you guys have come along. Um, so we gave away 200 million adverts inside the game for mental health charities, local and national, so that people are one button click away from getting help. Um, in Australia, a bunch of local charities there click on and you can be talking to someone in, in Melbourne straight away. So you can use it for that as well, as well as the social um, side of things. Having We've had players coming out in the game where a player comes out, you get a message saying that you've had a boost in your merchandise sales and nothing is mentioned again afterwards because that's how it should be. It shouldn't even be a story. I just, I just wanted to um, ask that question because... Of course, it does feel that football has been quite behind the times in terms of people being able to, to, to sort of come out. I mean, how do you feel that your work ha has helped kind of pave the way for that and, as you say, created a, a, a kind of safer environment? Um, we are fortunate enough to have a voice. We have a couple of million people who play our game each year. 20% of them play it for more than 500 hours. 60% of them play it for more than 100 hours. When you've got that canvas and you've got those eyeballs looking at it, if there are ways that you can help push positive messages that are non-political, because it's really important to understand that our audience is across all sides of yeah. the spectrum, um, but try and normalise something like people coming out, I think that can only be can only be a good thing. And in other sports, it's just not a problem. You know, people have come out in rugby, not a problem. Women's football, not a problem. But in men's football, there's still a big stigma there. So um, we need to try and get rid of stigmas like that. It's ridiculous. It's 2022. Yeah, but it's, it's interesting because I think, it, particularly in, in fields which I think are quite hard to change attitudes, doing it through, you know, the power that you have through a game is, is, is a really, um, it's a really savvy way of coming at it because also people don't want to be preached to or lectured um, either. That's not the most effective way to, to make change. You can partially thank EastEnders for it because they are absolutely brilliant at dealing with these, sub these kinds of subjects. Yeah, um, and we're going to come actually on to talk about some specific um, TV shows with, with Simon, but Samir, um, I want to come to you next. I mean, you've had a really, really interesting career because you have spanned so many different organisations. You've worked with many high-level organisations for change. You've worked with charities. You've got a background in film. And, of course, you very recently joined Comic Relief. And Comic Relief is the absolute symbol of bringing together entertainment and social um, impact. Just give us some of your reflections um, in your first year there, particularly because you've been on both sides. You've been, you know, you've worked with broadcasters, you've worked with charities as well, but now you're kind of sitting on, on top of it all. How does that collaboration work and how does it work best? Yeah, well, I think to that point that was just made, you know, it's, it, it's not about, 
you know, preaching or lecturing, but how do you make being charitable fun, essentially? How do you make it not hard work? You know, if someone's, you know, sitting on the sofa watching a telly and they happen to learn about gender justice, but in an engaging way where they don't even realize it, well then, great. And so I think our DNA is very much, you know, the power of entertainment to create change. And so we've been doing that, you know, sort of throughout our history, and now we're, you know, trying to do it in a more sort of cohesive, strategic uh, manner. And of course, having that partnership with BBC is just a huge platform that we have, where we can endlessly sort of try different things. You know, we're now doing, in addition to the the Red Nose Day show that everyone knows about, you know, we're doing long form documentaries. We're partnering with different uh, shows on different channels, like Glow Up on BBC Three. So. Yeah, I, I think ultimately it just comes down to how can you be engaging, how can you make, uh, you know, thinking about helping someone else or learning about an issue as uh, kind of seamless and entertaining as possible. And Comic Relief is, is interesting because it's become such um, a success story that often when something does become a big success story, there is a backlash that comes with it. And there has been a bit of a, a backlash to, you know, very, very good intentions. How do you navigate your way through that? Yeah, well, I think, you know, any time you deal with entertainment, any time you deal with mass culture, you know, the, the more people you reach, the more kind of reactions you're going to get. The important thing for us is just constant evolution, constant learning, and ultimately, you know, we're a charity, so we are about a purpose, we are about an impact, and so that's really where our focus is, and we will try different things and try to um, raise awareness in different ways and get people to care in different ways, but, you know, certainly, uh, you know, we've, we've evolved the way we do storytelling now, you know, we, we work with people with lived experience of the issues, we work with local filmmakers, um, and I think that's important. I think that's only going to continue. You know, I don't think that the charity sector has kind of figured out how to raise awareness or raise funds when you're dealing with the world where your impact metrics are changing. It's not about the number of, you know, malaria nets delivered. It's about, you know, have you supported these organizations in a way where you essentially get out of the way and let them do the work because they're closest to the communities and issues. Well, that changes all your old metrics and your way of measuring things and so forth. And that also will change then, well, what are the, how are the ways you raise awareness of that and get people to want to donate to that when it's not, you know, maybe that simple message that we've had for sort of 20 or 30 years. So all of that just takes constant kind of learning, evolving, and trying new things. And when you're, um, you know, mapping out what success looks like for comic relief, how much of it is just fundraising and also how much is, how do you measure that social impact? Because it is the two things which are important, isn't it? It's not, I mean, obviously the, the cold hard cash is always very important, but the social impact is really important. How do you measure that? So it's all about social impact. So the fundraising is just the way, because we are a grant maker and we're, you know, a, an exceptionally large grant maker. Um, the way in which we do that is we have to raise income, so it's a means to an end, but you know, just fundraising metrics on their own don't really tell us anything. It's really about you know, what is that enabling, and so even when we talk about entertainment for change, and there are all the things that we do around that, how we engage through mass culture, how we use BBC, but there's also the funding side of things. So we've created a fund, um, kind of power of popular culture for social change, this is bringing together a few different foundations who are now really trying to advance this field, drive new learnings, sort of start to grow this field in the UK. There's more of this work being done in the US. And so I think that kind of work is very important when you start to get into what are the structural issues around entertainment and change? How do we measure that? Um, you know, how do we support different organizations who are kind of working in this area? Um, so yeah, as you can imagine for a charity, our impact framework and measurement frameworks are quite vast and complex, but it really depends on, there's no one metric, it really depends on the type of work. And as I mentioned, I think that for us and for the sector, those metrics are changing absolutely as you work in a world where you, know, you are trying to sort of uh, decolonialize wealth and philanthropy and take a more relational approach to funding that changes all the old metrics. So we're in the process of you know, we're doing a lot of work right now where we're working with different organizations that we fund to figure out what's important for them. How do they essentially 
um, define impact? What do they need to measure their own impact? And how can they kind of educate us on, on what they need? Thank you so much, um, Samir. Um, Simon, I'm going to turn to you next. And you've been the Chief Executive Officer at CALM, which is a brilliant, brilliant charity which looks at mental health issues and suicide prevention. Um, but before that, you were in the entertainment business before. And you've really been, I suppose, at the kind of forefront of some really interesting creative partnerships you've created with lots of different MTV broadcasters from Dave and you've had this fantastic collaboration with Netflix with Afterlife so tell us a bit about the work you've been doing. I'd, I'd almost forgotten about that one. <laughs> uh, yeah um, it was always like the the intention to do that because I don't know how to run a charity I've got no idea so I just kind of carried on doing what I did before <laughs> and it sort of worked out and hired the kind of people that did the things that I understood so the fundamental the, the primary objective was to steal their audiences really uh, and we, we did a first piece of work with ITV and this morning who have been really really good partners for us right through the last Five years right across ITV, um, which is a thing called Project 84, which was uh, an awareness campaign um, which kind of blew the doors off for calm and sort of blew the doors off for awareness as well around suicide. But in trying to reach those audiences, at the time we were just tiny, we were a teeny tiny little organization, eight people. Wow. Um, there's a lot more than that now. Um, but there was no way to reach people unless we uh, hijacked audiences, which meant we hijacked, we, we worked with media owners. We re realised quite quickly that you couldn't work with a media owner unless the stuff got paid for and we didn't have any money. So we worked with brands to pay for stuff um, and, and came to quite a nice model, which is now not always necessary, but we, was kind of a funding brand partner in the shape of Spotify or Sayat Cars or Carling or whatever it might be. And then a media owner for us to get to that audience. And, and we're quite, we're not quite, we're very strategic and then very tactical about it that we, we've got really difficult, we've got a really hard issue to sell and that's around suicide prevention. And taking that into the world of entertainment it, is, it can be quite polarising. So it can be quite non-Newtonian for a start. Mm. If you go to, the, to an audience and start talking about suicide prevention, people are going to go, I don't want to talk about suicide. That's horrible. There can be quite a backlash to yeah, it. Yeah, 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 totally. Yeah. And, 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 and you don't want to frighten people. And you don't want, but we, we have to understand that, well, there's a, there's a fundamental truth that in order to prevent suicide, we have to talk about it. Um, and we, we started off being a bit more subtle. So we did... I, would certainly think of it as being entertainment. Shortly after we did Project 84 with This Morning uh, and ITV across the board, we went and did some work with uh, Top Shop and Top Man, where we were going to try to reach 16 to 24 year olds. Uh, and there we, we dialed it down a bit. And how did that work? So with something like you know, Top Man and, and Top Shop, how do you have that partnership, which is not just here's our brand, come and maybe a phone number and a website. How do you actually get a conversation going with young people busy in a shop? Well, first of all, with the, with the client, you've got to understand their commercial needs. They, they need people to come into, the, into Topshop or to go onto the website and buy more stuff. Um, so we, we did a thing called Eau de Chris, where we worked with Love Island. We got a guy called Chris Hughes, who was like the big standout star of, the, of, of Love Island him. and then we got him to cry into a bottle <laughs> and um, we put it on we put it for sale load of Chris <laughs> each bottle of water was infused with one of Chris Hughes's tears uh, Rankin shot a 30 second spot for it which we ran on ITV uh, and then of course it wasn't load of Chris it was ludicrous that uh, <laughs> suicide is the single biggest killer of young men. And so if, if you can bring Very people good. into your kind of world right, and then kind of take them on that, sorry to be a cliche, to take them on that journey to, to, to realisation. But then on the other sides, you've got to just be, well, well, you've got to be really clear with all the partners in place. So Dave, ITV, Netflix, Netflix needs more subscriptions. They work with us. We put benches around the country. We work with Ricky Gervais, which had, had backlash. You know, that was, that was, Difficult, you know. There's the, the, um, the we, we had some backlash working with him and working with Tyson Fury for, for obvious reasons. Um, but in getting to that audience, understand that the media owner, the audience owner, that whoever's paying for it, whether that's us or someone else, needs to get some kind of commercial benefit from it. Mm. That ben that benefit commercially might be a rehabilitation of their brand. It might be, but then what you really got to do is hold their feet to the fire. And how do you do that? You just, um, well, you build a really brilliant brand like Carmen, so we won't work with you if you don't do it right. But um, we, would, we don't ever get to that 
because we've got, so next Wednesday, uh, we, we kick off the biggest thing we've ever done um, with ITV and Bauer Media and uh, TikTok and Instagram and, and right across the board of, of, of media owners. Um, and, and they understand right from the beginning what it is we're trying to achieve. This is a really hard hitting one. This is really, really scary to do. But these are the kind of media owners that want to want to deliver the message because they understand its importance. Um, and so we have a very functioning uh, kind of clinical back end to advise idiots like me that don't know about that stuff and what we should be doing. We then put it through an incredible creative machine that's Adam and Eve DDB, who are our agency of record for our hard hitting stuff, not our silly ludicrous stuff. Um, and really, it's kind of hearts and minds because we'll, we'll, we'll achieve a huge amount next week from for the, the campaign we're doing. And the, the right partners want to achieve that with us and understand that their audience will benefit and therefore they will also benefit. It's really interesting to um, just hear you take us through the process. I and mean, from what you're saying, it sounds very important that if you're doing collaboration like this, you set out your parameters very clearly at the beginning. So it's everyone eyes wide open in terms of, you know, you're clear that there, there's obviously a commercial reason for people doing it, but you're clear about the, the aim and the message of, of what you're trying to do. Yeah, and I, and I think that in reaching those in specific, specific audiences, they're very well served by traditional charitable activity, but perhaps it's not for them. We did a, a campaign recently, we worked out that, somebody worked out that um, world Mental Health Day coincided with World Toilet Day. So we did a, a campaign that I printed onto massive toilet rolls that just said, feeling shit, shit. <laughs> and, and getting that in front of younger audiences, they're sort of like, yeah, it is shit. So then we went with ITV2, uh, we, got, we got a campaign at the moment called Whatever Gets You Through, which kind of debunks kind of bingy bongy candles and relaxation music. And it's more about eating hot dogs in the bath and acknowledging that feeling shit is shit. And for that audience, you need to reach them in that particular yeah. way. Other audiences are different. Well, I mean, the, the work you do is great. I mean, I, I don't know if many of you have seen Afterlife, but I think that's such a, a, power, such a powerful, funny, but moving way of exploring just some of the darkest feelings about grief and, and suicidal thoughts. And, you know, it was very, 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 very well done. I think that's probably a sort of comedy that's had huge impact in terms of changing a conversation yeah. particularly with older men i yeah. think which is quite a hard group to, um, to reach on that well thanks um for that um simon and um, sophie uh, welcome to the to the panel um tell us a bit about what kind of role platforms like meta can can play in terms of bringing these partnerships together and, and any reflections you have in terms of how you see social impact and charity and entertainment coming together on platforms? We have an extraordinary role at Meta to play in all of this. Um, we have half of humanity on our planet, um, which is something that comes with obviously a huge amount of privilege and also an extraordinary responsibility. And um, I've only been at Meta for about two years, although that feels like 20 because everything changes here so fast now. But um, I think, you know, we've all seen, haven't we, how a hashtag can create a global movement. Gurinder talked about Black Lives Matter and the Me Too movement, and there are thousands of other ones that exist around that. Um, I think we all remember the Ice Bucket Challenge that raised a huge amount of awareness and conscious around ALS. And off the back of that, as a platform, I think what's amazing is that the power is in the people um, in, in doing that. And so off the back of that, we then developed the capability and the functionality for people to raise money individually as charities. So now we have your ability to raise money for a charity for your birthday, for example. And when you've got half of humanity on your platform and that functionality sitting in everyone's hands, you have the ability to raise an extraordinary amount of money because I might only raise 20 pounds for Calm on my birthday by doing 20 sit-ups a day in July. But when you have tens and hundreds of thousands of people collectively coming together behind a movement that they're passionate about, then obviously that adds up really, really quickly. So I think we, we always, of course, our mission as an organization is to give people the power to build community and to bring the world closer together. And I think when people are passionate about entertainment, passionate about a cause or a movement, truly extraordinary things can happen. 
Um, and probably the, the, the last thing on that that's, that's worth uh, mentioning, because it's, it's so very topical, is when Russia invaded Ukraine. So we saw two extraordinary things happen there. So within about three days, over $20 million was raised on our platform, which, which at the time was more than any individual government had even given. Obviously, that's changed since then, and, and I'm sure that that $20 million is now probably more like 50. But even more than that, what I found really interesting was that in Europe, one in three people became friends with someone in the Ukraine. So they were showing their allyship, showing their support for this truly horrendous situation, um, merely by just connecting with people and showing compassion and care in that way. And in terms of the partnerships that you see being born on, on, on the different platforms, particularly between charity and entertainment, what do you think are the, the elements that make the best partnerships work and be successful on, on your platforms? Yeah, well, I think it's you know, everything that, that we've spoken about already. Um, we, we, do, we do know that amazing, thing happens. amazing things can happen when um, charity and entertainment can come together. We did a thing recently with, um, with Universal Music, allowing all of their back catalogue for a dementia app. 850,000 people in the UK suffer from dementia. Before I joined Meta, I was on the board of Boots, um, and every single pharmacist in Boots is trained to be dementia aware because um, we know a lot of people would come into our pharmacies um, with dementia, and that's why we took so many mirrors out of the pharmacist, because if you've got dementia and you see yourself in a mirror, it can be, can be incredibly confusing. So, um, I feel confused um, looking at myself in the mirror these days. Most I know, so I know. So, um, so, so, so this basically um, was, was an app, and I have to remind myself what it's called, um, the Vera app, that you can download, and through that you can, uh, you can access all of Universal Music's back catalogue. And, and, and because we know that music resonates so well, like music has such a memory, doesn't it? It's so, it's so triggering for people. When you mentioned Band-Aid, I immediately knew exactly, you know, the song was in my head. Um, so I think coming back to when, when we're connecting entertainment with causes and charities and objectives, it's about really understanding what do you want to achieve from that. Is it, is it fundraising? Is it, is it awareness? Is it um, you know, gathering people around an event or a particular point in time? Um, and we have so many different ways of helping charities um, you know, build, whether it's events, whether it's calendars, whether it's reminders, whether it's awareness, with the capabilities that we've got and, and also the reach. But I, I think really being clear on your objectives mm -hmm. is, what's, is what's so important. And also, um, back to the point around making sure that your objectives, I mean, I, I know you will know this, but making sure your objectives have a natural synergy yeah. and a fit. Because I think the one thing that people sniff out straight away is when something's inauthentic, don't yeah. they? I think that's absolutely right. And really, really interesting hearing you say that, because I think that's nicely sort of wrapped up a lot of the points that the panelists have made, you know, having a, a kind of clearly defined mission and purpose with the collaboration and um, to Simon's point to me to be making it really clear from the outset that this is what the expectation is and as you say having that authenticity in terms of a fit now we have a couple of minutes for any questions if any of you in the audience lovely I think do we have a roving mic or are people oh yes we do have a roving mm -hmm. mic we have a gentleman at the front I'm Sean Ryan from Save the Children. Um, this morning, the Reuters Institute published its annual report on digital media, and it showed that um, more people are avoiding the news now than are addicted to it, because the news is so depressing. And I wonder, having heard Samir talking about making charitable, being charitable fun, and having heard uh, Simon talk about Love Island Tears, uh, whether the panel might think that charity communications are a bit too serious and should we lighten up? That's a great question. Um, uh, Simon, I'll come, I'll come to you first. Uh, I th well, sorry, yes and no. So I, I th the, the use of entertainment for me is about, and listening to everybody else talking, is about engage sorry, engagement. Sorry, bear with me. But you know, the, if, if we're going to go with the traditional approach to benevolence uh, or to, 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 to charitable 
fundraising, whatever, but you, you kind of stand on the, on the side, you talk about the issue, and then you tell people you can give some money to help. Um, what we, we try to do is, is, is to engage in a, in, a, in, a, in a much deeper way to get an emotional connection to what it is we're trying to achieve. And that emotional connection sometimes isn't about lightening up. We actually made a, we made a COVID blocker um, at the start of lockdown, so you could just turn it on for three hours or whatever, and it would block any mention of COVID from your Chrome browser. Um, but sometimes engagement is really, really hard. We worked for a long time with Coronation Street around a storyline, which was very, very, very engaging and raised suicide awareness more than any single thing we'd done up to that point. But that wasn't lightening up. That was tough, really hard. But then other times we can do stuff with, you know, with, with Netflix, with Spotify, which is, which is all about full-on engagement, well, full-on... Full this is a building, and that's... Target everything, every single minutiae. Um, it's unfortunate that the days of just coming up with something and then rolling out and everyone's going to take it, they're gone because um, thanks to technology, you can target people in much better ways. It's a really interesting point. You can't really have a one-size-fits-all um, anymore. Um, Samir. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> it, it, I completely agree with Miles. I mean, it's just about meeting people where they are. But it's also about you know, who are the messengers you know, for these stories? Who are the storytellers? Um, you know, we did a documentary um, about suicide prevention with BBC um, that Roman Kemp was involved with and, and hosting. And he has a per personal connection. He's talked about his own struggles with mental health and depression. His friend took his life. And so uh, that, you know, he can sort of tell that story in a different way. And, with a personal connection, and also draw in an audience that's interested in him from his other work. And so that's not really comic relief, you know, talking about we're we're making this content happen, but it's you know it's not about us, um, and it's not us kind of you know giving a message. So yeah, I think it's very much meeting people where they are, but also thinking about you know who are the people that have currency with your different audiences, who are the people that have you know an authentic connection or perspective that can help get something across. Um, and Sophie, in terms of how you see, um, you know, platforms helping to, to get the message out, I mean, how, how do people navigate um, the, the point that the, the gentleman had, which is there is a lot of depression about the news. There's often a lot of fatigue right now about bad news. I mean, even Ukraine, I know as a journalist, it is important, but it is kind of dropping down the, the news agenda. I mean, how do you find these collaborations stay sort of fresh and get cut through, particularly on your platforms? Well, I, th I think the, the benefit of, of the reach that we have, so in the UK, for example, obviously I gave the half of humanity example, we have 43 million people um, every month and 33 million people every day. So it's, th there's, it's almost like the sort of the, there's two different roles to play, isn't there? One is to make sure that the facts are, are, are clearly available um, for, for people who, who need to quickly be able to find them. And then the other is, Actually, if you want to do um, different moments throughout a year, um, and, and there's a sort of there's almost like an always on of sort of news and information that comes through, and then you have your sort of different tentpole moments, whether it's around you know a huge sort of marquee TV event or an ongoing collaboration with a TV show or whatever that is. So it's that you know the platforms can really do and help support both jobs, I think, really well, and I think you'll find that probably different people respond differently depending on what they need and where they are in, in their journey. Um, but I, I, I do think that the, I mean, you know, there are incredible groups in Facebook for really, really difficult topics, you know, grief, grief being one of them. So um, I think it's, it's, it's more about just making sure that you're able to show up where people need to hear you and, and there will be groups where it is about, you know, suicide awareness, suicide prevention, or supporting families who've, you know, terribly, tragically lost someone through suicide versus a more engaging campaign where what you want to do is sort of fundraising and get really people sort of united behind a movement. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's interesting. I think different audiences will come at, will come at different points, I suppose, to, to your point. Yeah, I think there's a lot of news fatigue, but I suppose when there is a big moment or a big crisis, that does get cut through in, 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 in some way to people, and then it probably drives all the other forms of 
communication and, and targeting as well. I think we've got time for another question. Um, yeah, there's a lady here just by this pillar. Hello. Um, so, I mean, it kind of feels like this is the norm now, but to, to say that we are in such exceptional circumstances, and maybe it's because I'm, I'm a young person and I'm kind of thinking maybe the world's always been like this. Am I only just realising this, or is it actually kind of crazy times? But No, it is a bin fire. Right? <laughs> yeah. I'm just like... <laughs> And when I think about sort of like all the work that, that you guys do and I think about I think about fundraising, I think about how a lot of there are a lot of young people out there who are really, really um, wanting to do something. They're taking to the streets, they are dedicating a lot of their time and energy and uh, time online to this sort of stuff, but they might not have uh, you know, cold hard cash to give. And cold hard cash does you know, keep keep the world going at this point. But I'm wondering if that's kind of fed into how you guys are. I mean, I love uh, honestly, Simon. I love this this all these collaborations that you're doing, which are about um, changing narratives and things like that. It's it's not so much a focus on like giving us money, just giving us time. And so, I would just love to know about how you know all these organisations who are in the room, more stuff that we can do to kind of engage and work with you know younger audiences, people who have that time to give, but maybe not. Ne necessarily that money to Great give. Great question. What, what's your name? Emma. Where are you from, Emma? Uh, in the country or company? Where, where do you work for? Do <laughs> I work for BBC. Brilliant. It's a really great question, Emma. Um, we've probably just got five minutes, so if we could be reasonably pithy with, with our answers. But what a great, great question. And actually, that does go to the heart of, of a lot of the, the conversations today. Yes, money is one aspect of it. But, you know, how can people get involved to make social change, whether it's changing the narrative, whatever can be done to, to move the, the needle? Simon, I'll start with you. I, I got really excited about three years ago before it all went bin fire um, by, by, two, by, by uh, G.A. Germ before it was appropriated by the far right and by the uh, second Idols album. Joy is an act of resistance that, that, that I wanted anger. We wanted some anger. We really wanted to get people to, to see this issue that's right at the heart of our society is what we view as a barometer on how we're doing. Let's get really fucking angry about it. Um, and we, 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 we've done that in various ways. Uh, that sometimes anger isn't right. Sometimes you, you, you have to provide, you, to stimulate impotent rage is awful. So you have to give a solution. You have to give us uh, uh, something that people can do about it. And we, as, a, as an organization, never ask for money. It's a bit weird and it's hard to get your head around to begin with, but we don't ask anybody to give us any money. You can, but. The important thing for us is either whether it's through anger, whether it's through a desire to uh, spread messages of hope in order to stretch hope for younger audiences or, or bring it closer for older ones. So, um, I mean, do you have an ask of people then? If you're not asking for money, if people yeah. come to you, what? Yeah, so uh, we, we were all about a movement. That, so that was the, the GA germ bit that got me excited. Um, now, now we're all about united against suicide. So this is, uh, if, if we can get... The, the, the hearts and minds of the population to understand the issue and to see that as something that we need to, we need to talk about and we need to carry with us in our daily lives because we care about the people around us. I mean, that's the fundamental truth of it. Then they will give us money. They will do something. They will put on a gig or run a race or send us a, a check or something. But we're, again, I saw it the second time, but non-Newtonian that bringing people into what we try to achieve is that is, has worked very well for us in a long-term, mid-term okay. view. Bin fires notwithstanding. <laughs> uh, so movements are very important. I think it's really interesting that your first point of action is not asking for money. I think that's really interesting. Miles, a great, great question to, from Emma. Volunteer. You have skills. You work for the BBC. <laughs> Pretty much every charity out there is going to want you to help them. Um, so if you find a cause that you're passionate about, turn around and say, hey, are my skills... Can you use my skills for a couple of hours a week? Is there anything that I can help you with? They'd be absolutely delighted to hear from you, particularly the smaller charities that desperately need help in every single area. Um, so, so, yeah, it's, it's not just about money. It's about spreading the message and how, how you can help them get that message out. Because every, every charity, if a charity doesn't have a good message to get out, then they're not really doing their job. So... Um, and they won't survive because no one will give them money unless they've got a good message. Um, but, you know, I'm not very young and the world, the world has changed so much. I, I don't understand TikTok. Um, younger people do. Charities, there'll be lots of people in charities that don't understand that, that don't, that don't understand Meta. Um, 
in the same way as younger generations do. So literally reach out, offer your skills. Your, your arm will be bitten off, as the old phrase goes. Brilliant. Thank you, um, Miles. Um, Samir, I'm going to come to you in a minute. But Sophie, I just want to bring you in at this point, because I think something which has really mobilised activism, particularly with young people, of course, are social media platforms. So how can social media platforms, we know that young people do a lot of political um, and social engagement, but you know, what more can be done with, with platforms, particularly for young people? Well, I think, you know, if, if we go back to, um, I'm 50 now, so when I first started work, everything digital, and I started to work in the digital world was 1995, it was, a, it was a computer on your desk, and it was words, and then it became words and pictures, and now the whole world is a documentary maker and a cameraman because we have a mobile phone in our pocket, and the whole world has the ability to tell stories. Um, and, and I think, you know, there's, there's the opportunity to think about what you can do as an individual influencer. You, you don't have to be someone with Kim Kardashian, right, with goodness knows how many, ever many, you know, over 100 million followers that, that she has. You can, you can have a, gr a group of people telling a story about a cause that you're passionate about in a really compelling way that on a scale of multiples can have equally the same amount of impact. Yeah. You know, you, you can reach the same amount of people by having either, you know, one, one influencer with 100,000 followers or, you know, 100,000 people. And, and, and I think that really is the power of social media and, and tapping into that, whether you're an individual that wants to support something or an organization is, is uh, you know, I, I'd really think about the power of the mass and yeah. not just the power of, 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 of the one person. And actually, I think when you get, then get you know, either celebrity endorsement or sort of super, superstar endorsement, whatever that might look like, you know, David Beckham for UNICEF versus people in the UK who love football. Yeah. I mean, that's, that, that's, that's where the magic can happen on our platforms. Yeah. But don't, don't ever underestimate the impact that you have as an individual. Yeah. And I think just um, backing that up, I mean, working in sort of journalism and, and having worked in politics as well, it is amazing the power that activism does have on, on social media. And I was just looking at a really interesting case, the Reclaim the, the Streets, um, which of course has been very timely with all the Sarah Everard stuff and then the, the police sort of, yeah. and they've just won their appeal and a, a lot of their support. And it's not a big organisation, it's three women basically. And so much of that was carried on the shoulders of, or carried in the palm of our hands in terms of people lending their support to this campaign. Um, Samir, we will finish with, with you, um, just a one minute answer, thank you. Yeah, so I think a lot, of, um, a lot of activism today is sort of directed sort of outwards and upwards, you know? So it's very much around um, a policy or what a government is doing or speaking out about something or taking a stand. But there's also, and, and it reminds me of the previous question around the news, it's not just about consumption of information or speaking out about something, it's about participation. And I think uh, in this, and there are so many vehicles for participation where social change happens. So for example, the power of sport for young people that can affect their mental health, that can affect um, you know, their, even their kind of social prospects. Um, the power of debate amongst young people in schools, the power of the arts to engage people and affect their mental health. And if you look at something like sport, where you have almost three levels, you have the professional sort of leagues and bodies at the top, then you have this semi-professional in the middle, which is sort of governed by a lot of the bodies like Sport England and so forth. But then you have this huge network at the bottom that is not governed by you know sport england or independent agencies and so forth but that are small community-based organizations that are involving people on an everyday basis and that's where participation is needed and that's where support is needed but that's also where social change happens and so i met with a group of activists and we were talking about a number of things and it was interesting how few of them had actually looked for something local to get involved with in their own community or neighborhood. And you can feel powerless because the issues are big and you, know, you don't know how to create vast yeah. systemic change, which you know needs to happen. But I do think there's something just about civic participation, community-based change that can happen. And there's so many vehicles out there like arts and sports and other things. Great. And by the way, they're all getting their funding cut. They all need support. They're operating on a shoestring, but they're making real change happen. And those are the organizations that really need our support. And I, that's where I'd encourage people to look to get involved with. 
So local. The other thing I would say to a young person, vote. That is also a very, very important yeah. way of getting your voice out. Listen, it's been a real pleasure hosting this panel. I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you for all your questions. Please give a warm round of applause to our brilliant panel.